And I'll tell you guys since we're since we're all friends. Every character I write has a piece of me in them. Hi, I'm Lee Bardugo, and you're listening to the Grisha Cast. Welcome to Grisha Cast, episode 44. In this episode, we are covering chapters 18 through 21 from the book Crooked Kingdom. This is your host, Eric. And I'm Terry. From Nashville, Tennessee, this is your podcast for all things Grishaverse. A world created by the wonderful Lee Bardugo. Moi Savienyi, casters. Hello. Hi. Hi. How are you all? I'm so good. How are you? Oh, we're <laughs> we're here. We're doing it. We are. We're doing it. Mm-hmm. Mm. So for those of you asking how you can help, we would greatly appreciate tips. Your tips will help us to continue to bring you Grisha Cast. You can Venmo a tip to at B-O-D-H-I-M-M. Or cash app dollar sign B-O-D-H-I-M-M. Dollar bills, y'all. And thank you so much for those who have already contributed. Exactly. Thank you so much. We love you so much. We do. Oh, um, so we've got our listener cities. We do. We do have listener cities. The first one <laughs> <laughs> is St. Therese in Montreal, Quebec. Ooh, okay. <laughs> and we have Malapuram, India. We were prepared today. Mm. And <laughs> um, then we have Kampung Phuket in Malaysia. I'm so sorry. Thank you all so much. We are very sorry. We normally try to like at least know how to pronounce. Yes. And the producer had to find the most difficult words in human existence for and we, us. <laughs> and we did not like. We didn't prepare. We kind of forgot to like sorry, look y'all. at it before we started. So we probably should have just said the country. So that would have um, probably been easier. It probably would have been. But we appreciate you. And I still think it's the coolest thing ever. Yeah, so thank you guys. Hopefully you don't hate us now since... <laughs> oh. How about contact us, info at GrishaCast, and tell us... <laughs> yeah. ...how to pronounce it. Oh, goodness. Love you. Love you guys. <laughs> so, it's been a short kind of week. I mean, it has like, it's been. been. It's been one of those weird weeks. It went by fast. Well, I never knew what day it was. That's true. Yeah, it definitely, it just feels so weird, like, that tomorrow actually is Friday. I know. It's so weird. Okay, so Wednesday morning, I woke up, <laughs> my alarm went off, and I slept so hard the night before that I was so confused as to why my alarm went off. I was laying there forever, like, what is happening? Why is this happening? And then I was like, oh, crap, I got to get my older kid up for the bus. So then I, you know, throw a bra on, and I run out in the hallway, and then I'm, like, stopping, and I was like, wait a minute. He's not even here. <laughs> oh, oops. <laughs> so I just, I had to stand in the hallway and have like a moment with myself of like, what day is this? What is happening? Yeah. What's going on? <laughs> I was so confused. But that's what you were talking about. About It just went by so weird and fast and all the days just kind of went blue. Yeah, it was really weird. It was just really weird. Um, I'm happy because I'm glad that the weekend is like yes. right there around the corner, but still it was just so odd it was and but. i'm I'm looking for it we're going away to a secluded cabin over the weekend oh. next to a river so nice. yes it'll be very nice too and we're going to just go completely off grid so it'll be nice for a few days yeah sounds lovely yes thank goodness i I'm, need it i think i'm gonna go to like a secluded room <laughs> in the back of your house in the back of my house mm-hmm. turn the lights out and light some of your yummy candles. Yeah. Put the fan on high and lock my door. Sweet. <laughs> and get in my bed and just stay there. <laughs> That'd be amazing. That sounds lovely too. It does. <laughs> It'd probably be what you're doing in your cabin, anyways. Yeah. The thing though is that, like, we, it's nice to get away because if I'm at home, then I'm thinking about all the other things that I have to do. I'm like, oh, right. I got to fold that laundry and the dishes in the sink and, uh, And this way, when we get away, then at least you can actually relax because there's nothing else to do. Yes. I hear you. And there's a river. And there's a swinging bed, which would be cool. It's like on the back porch. It's like a swinging day bed. 
That sounds lovely. I imagine I'm going to be there the whole time. <laughs> yeah, that's what I would do. I think it's supposed to rain, too, so it'll be kind of cool to listen to the rain in the river. Yes, I love the sound of water. Mm-hmm, me, too. It makes mm-hmm. me feel so much better. Mm. Uh, I wish too bad we... we don't live next to, like, a beach or... I know. Well, yeah. There's a river near here, but... Oh, yeah. There's lots of water. But not one that you we can, like, hear. Well... No. Hey, that's what sound <laughs> effects are for. I know. Uh, yes, I've totally been. Yeah. There's an app called Headspace. Have you heard of that? Mm-mm. It's really cool. Um, and there's a, they have like podcasts, but they're called Sleepcast and they put you to sleep. I swear they're actually hypnotizing you. <laughs> okay. Because I'm out. Like I've never heard the whole thing because I just passed the heck out. But um, my favorite one is Rainy Day Antiques. And it like has the rain falling in the background and it's this guy's voice telling you like telling the story about how you find this building that has these little windows and you walk in and you see these books and you see and it's just like I just I pass the heck out. Oh, wow. It's really cool. So I highly recommend that. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I w- <laughs> now I just want to go to bed. But know, we've okay. got to do our podcast. <laughs> I know. I just made myself kind of sleepy thinking about it. Well, let's Maybe get... it does hypnotize me. It probably does. It probably does. And we should probably get started so we don't fall asleep. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we have four chapters this time. We do, but they're short. They were really short. Short, but like especially this first one, there was action. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. And I had the first one. No. Nope, you have the first one. I have the one first one. Because you're even. I did chapter 18, which was Kaz. So... Kaz and Wylan are at Van X and are ready to break in. Kaz is a little thrown off about how easy it is to be kind of breaking in. And he climbs onto the roof and goes in through the windows. And then Wylan is still on the ground floor. He's going to let him in on the ground floor. Kaz isn't that excited that he's doing another job with Wylan. But Wylan does have the knowledge that Kaz doesn't. About like Van Eck, you know, being his dad and stuff, and the house. And anyways, um, in case any surprises pop up, Wylan will be great to have around. So Kaz does, of course, start thinking about a Nege and has like a little moment of worry, just like, oh, I hope she's okay in her silos. Oh. Yeah. If only he knew. Um <laughs> Yeah, there's stuff going on. Yeah, so and we'll get there. Yes. The locks on the window are the exact locks he planned for, so really easy to get on the inside. The room he has broken into is on the top floor where all the staff would be staying. So he's broke, he's kind of in their rooms, but they're empty because Vanex is throwing a fabulous party. <laughs> and of course, all his staff is working it. So, you know, they can't be there. So here's a quote. He opened the door and quietly made his way to the staircase, then proceeded cautiously down to the second floor. He knew Van Eck's house from when he and Inej had heisted the decapel oil, and he always liked returning to a home or a business he'd had cause to visit before. It wasn't just the familiarity. It was as if by returning, he laid claim to a place. We knew each other's secrets. The house seemed to say, welcome back. End quote. I'd be freaked out if a house said, welcome back. <laughs> yeah, but that that painted a, you know, a good picture. It's like, it's a familiar, familiarity. I know. Because you've been there before. It's not like a surprise. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Well, so... There is a guard at the end of the hall in front of what Kaz assumes is Alice's room. There's a flash of light from the window and the guard goes to investigate. Of course, this is part of the plan. That's why when Kaz goes down the opposite end of the hall and goes into what used to be Wyland's room, but now is a nursery. Kaz goes and opens the window and secures the rope ladder. And Wylan comes chugging along and (laughs) climbs into the room with Kaz. And the plan is to exit this exact same way. After some tricks up their sleeve and such, they make it to the study that they have been trying to get to. So Wylan tells Kaz that the safe is behind the portrait. And it's a portrait of, like, 
a great great grandfather Van Eck, supposedly the Van Eck that started their family's great fortune. They both grab aside the painting and take it down to reveal a safe. Ah. <laughs> It's actually almost like a vault they describe. Mm -hmm. It's like this huge thing. So Wyland then pulls out two jars of this mysterious liquid. Um, and combined, I guess they make something that will burn through almost anything. It's this, except for the special bottles they're in. So anyways, Wyland pours one liquid into the other. Nothing happens, but he takes a dropper and he... Gets some of the liquid out and puts it on top of the vault. And it starts to sizzle and make this noise and smells horrible. So Sounds dangerous. Yeah, it does. <laughs> Definitely, like, for Wylan, who's, like, chugging along and, like, yeah. you could just hear it, like, just breaking. Don't fall. No. So here's another quote. After what felt like a lifetime, the hole was big enough to reach through. Kaz shone the bone light inside and saw a ledger, stacks of Krug, and a little velvet bag. Kaz drew the bag from the safe, wincing when his arm made contact with the edge of the hole. The steel was still hot enough to singe. He shook the contents of the bag into his leather-clad palm, a fat gold ring with an engraving of a red laurel and Van X initials. He tucked the ring into his pocket, then grabbed a couple of stacks of Krug and handed one over to Wyland. End quote. So, anyways, it's just a lot of stuff going on. We had to know what's going on inside there. And we're about to do our first scene, which is also, by the way, the end of our chapter. Aww. Yeah. So we're also going to be playing some wonderful music in the background, that beautiful instrumental, Never Forget. So I will be playing, by the way, Wyland, and Tara will be playing Kaz. Okay, so. Typecasting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, curtain up. Kaz almost laughed at the expression on Wyland's face. Does this bother you, Merchling? I don't enjoy feeling like a thief. After everything he's done? Yes. So much for righteousness. You do realize we're stealing your money? Jesper said the same thing, but I'm sure my father wrote me out of his will as soon as Alice became a pregnant. That doesn't mean you're any less entitled to it. I don't want it. I just don't want him to have it. What a luxury to turn your back on luxury. Kaz shoved the Krug into his pockets. How would I run an empire? Wyland said, tossing the pipette into the safe to smolder. I can't read a ledger or a bill of louding. I can't write a purchase order. My father is wrong about a lot of things, but he's right about that. I'd be a laughingstock. So pay someone to do that work for you. Would you? Asked Wylan, his chin jutting forward. Trust someone with that knowledge with a secret that could destroy you? Yes, thought Kaz without hesitation. There's one person I would trust. One person I know would never use my weaknesses against me. He thumbed quick quickly through the ledger and said, When people see a cripple walking down the street, leaning on his cane, what do they feel? Wylan looked away. People always did when Kaz talked about his limp, as if he didn't know what he was or how the world saw him. They feel pity. Now, what do they think when they see me coming? Wyland's mouth quirked up at the corner. They think they'd better cross the street. Kaz tossed the ledger back in the safe. You're not weak because you can't read. You're weak because you're afraid of other people seeing your weakness. You're letting shame decide who you are. Help me with the painting. They lifted the portrait back into place over the gaping hole in the safe, Martin Van Eck glaring down at them. Think on it, Wylan, Kaz said as he straightened the frame. It's shame that lines my pockets, shame that keeps the barrel teeming with fools ready to put a mask on just so they can have what they want with no one the wiser for it. We can all endure all kinds of pain. It's shame that eats men whole. Wise words, said a voice from the corner. Kaz and Wylan whirled. The lamps flared brightly, flooding the room with light, and a figure emerged from a niche in the opposite wall that hadn't been there a moment before. 
Pekka Rollins, a smug grin on his ruddy face, bracketed by a cluster of dime lions, all carrying pistols, saps, and axe handles. Kaz Brecker, Rollins mocked, philosopher crook. Uh-oh. End scene. And we by the trouble. Yeah. And yeah, I played um, Rollins, but I couldn't tell you that in the beginning of the scene because it's a surprise. <laughs> it's a surprise that he's there. It is. So that's the end. That was a lot. So, but there's like the really good thing in there though about you're weak because you're afraid of other people seeing your weakness. Yeah. You're letting shame decide who you are. Yes. That's a life lessons from Kaz Brecker. Yeah. It's a really good line. It actually is. Yeah, I remember listening. I listened to that a couple times, actually. And I, I just, that one line, you're letting shame decide who you are. Mm-hmm. True. Yep, something to think about. Mm-hmm. But we got company. We do. All right. So chapter <laughs> 19. Okay. Speaking of company. Yeah. Remember, we're in the tomb and all of a sudden, like, people are showing up, like, shooting at the tomb. And they're like, oop, we got company. Who is this? This is Matthias. Oh, there yeah. you go. That makes sense. So there's the gunfire is still like all at, there's a, <laughs> there's tons of gunfire at the tomb. Um, the men firing are in quote uniforms of the barrel, not stod watch uniforms. Jesper recognizes one of them, and they are able to sort out that it's the Dime Lions. Hey. Those stupid men. Yeah. As Jesper is shooting, the one they recognized, Doty. Tells them they've smashed their boats and there's no way off the island. They only have a couple of the violet light bombs and a couple flash bombs left from uh, Wyland who's left that behind. Matthias is like, um, hold on. We got more than that. We got two Grisha. Ooh. He asks Kuwe if he could produce more heat from a flame. Kuwe says he can make it burn more intensely. Then Matthias remembers that the violet flame burns hotter than regular fire. Remember our violet fire. Yeah. So the current plan at the moment is Matthias is going to set off a bomb. Kuwe is going to get to the front door as fast as possible and head straight to the tomb with the broken mast. Jesper will grab all the powders that Wyland left. Oh, okay. So the bomb goes off and they all head out. Matthias kicks open the tomb door, throws a flash bomb, and hides in the trees as he shoots back at the dime lions. And I have a quote here because it just paints a better picture as what's going on because I tried to explain it and it was more words than the yeah. actual quote. <laughs> <laughs> the dime lions returned fire and Matthias dove beneath a slump of moss covered stone. He saw Jesper charge through the tomb door, revolvers blazing, cutting toward the broken stone mast. Matthias lobbed the last flash bomb into the air as Jesper rolled to the right and the roar of gunfire erupted like a storm breaking as the Dime Lions forgot all promise of discipline or offer of reward and let fly with everything they had. They might have been ordered to keep Kuwait alive, but they were barrel rats, not trained soldiers, end quote. So I also kind of liked how that was written. Well, yeah, and it does paint a better picture. It does. <laughs> so... It's a much better picture. Yeah. So it's a little chaotic. Um, they and they've always said that they'll never kill Kuwe because they want him alive, but with all this chaos, these guys are like, just shoot. Yeah. So the three of them are at the broken mast, and Matthias asks Jesper if he can manipulate the powders because the black veil is supposed to be haunted and they're about to make ghosts. Mm-hmm. But Matthias is <laughs> done with them asking questions. <laughs> He's like, yeah. I'm running the show now. Stop asking me questions. <laughs> Which is very interesting. It is, but it kind of goes back to his training. Yeah. Because you weren't supposed to ask questions. He's a juicy gala. He is. So he explains the plan and they're ready to go. He opens the packet of powder and Jesper makes it rise into a cloud and then makes it float over the, do the dime lion's heads and it catches in one of the torches, which makes like a big burst of green. And now it's Kuwait's turn. He makes the flame creep along the handle and sneaking down the arm of the guy holding it, which is creepy and weird. Um, of course, the guy freaks, throws the torch, and the flame goes out. Matthias is like, do it again. And this time, he makes one of the, Kuwe makes one of the lanterns explode, causing a huge yellow flame. He mm. makes the flame turn into a kind of a snake figure again. And then Jesper tosses another powder into the air, sending the flame. Sending it into the flame, which makes it burn red this time. 
And then Kuei then makes all the lantern flames into kind of snakes that all kind of meet up together. Mm-hmm. One guy's like, ghost! And Matthi- <laughs> Matthias kind of sees his own sort of ghost as he remembers that it was an Inferni who burned his own village. Oh. He tells Kuei to turn the fire to the trees. And as the trees caught fire, the dime lines realize they have Grisha. <laughs> The three take off to the sandbar while Matthias sets off another violet bomb. Kuwait throws out his hands and actually parts the water like Moses. Wow, <laughs> so a little biblical here. I had to read it a couple times. He like throws the the violet fire into the water and uses that to kind of part the water. And they see all kinds of like fish and stuff at the bottom. It took me That's a couple true. read-throughs to know what was happening. That's going to um, be really cool to see. Yeah, I can't even imagine. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they run to the other side of the canal, and Matthias overcomes the voice in his head that kept saying unnatural with the Grisha. Instead, he comes up with miraculous, like Moses, right? Yeah. Um, big moment for him, as Jesper points out, he just led his own Grisha army. Aw, he needs oh. a staff, and then he could... He <laughs> really looked like Moses, the, the parting of the Red Sea. And I like how the um, the end of this chapter reads... He remembers that Nina had said the ice court was made by Grisha, Mm -hmm. though he had been told it was gel. So he starts thinking that maybe gel works through Grisha, that gel led him to Nina, and he needs to find her immediately so that they could survive the night and change the world. Aww. So he had a change of heart. Yeah. He has seen the light, the violet light. Which is... He, I I told you I love his character. Matai. I yeah I like the I like characters that have evolution, the ups and downs, and yeah, yeah. Okay. And that's in a chapter, by the way. Yeah. yeah. Well, where we started with him, like this, oh yeah, oh so just, angry. Yeah, angry and just wanted to kill all Grisha. Mm-hmm. Ugh. So, anyways, that leads us into our next chapter. All these chapters are filled with action, by the way. Yeah, it's just kind of go 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 go. Which are really hard to put into your own words. Yes. <laughs> so that's why sometimes we read a lot of quotes and do scenes because trying to put it into our own words, we might as well just read you the book, I feel like sometimes. But um, <laughs> a little bedtime story with Eric and Terry. Yeah. So chapter 20 is Inej. So here we go. Inej actually, last time um, we felt like she was about to fall into the silo, yes. but she doesn't. She catches herself and grabs hold and doesn't fall in. She makes it safely on top of the silo. She looks up to see what just happened, and she actually can't believe what she sees. There is a tall girl on the top of the silo with her. She has... Yeah! She has auburn hair and is wearing a fancy white and gold leather outfit. Oh, and her hair is in a thick braid with jewels laced within. Inej thinks she looks about a year or two older than her. And then that's going to lead into our next scene. So, I'm going to play special girl. (laughs) (laughs) Mystery girl. Uh, Mystery girl, who we're about to find out who she is. And Tara's going to play Inej. And I didn't say this last time, but... A special thank you for our background music created by Kendra Dantes and produced by Year 26. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. It's so awesome. It is. I love it. I do too. So we are going to start our scene. Get ready, peeps. Curtain up. <laughs> Hello, Wraith. The girl said. Do I know you? I am Dunyasha, the White Blade, trained by the sages of Aret Jen, the greatest assassin of this age. Doesn't ring a bell. I'm new to this city, the girl acknowledged, but I'm told you are a legend on these filthy streets. I confess I thought you'd be taller. What business? Inej asked. The traditional Kirch greeting at the beginning of any meeting, though it felt absurd to say it 20 stories in the air. Dunyasha smiled. It seemed practiced like the smiles Inej had seen girls give customers in the gilded menagerie parlor. A crude greeting for a crude city. 
She flicked her fingers carelessly toward the skyline, acknowledging the dismissing Ketterdam with a single gesture. Fate brought me here. And does fate pay your wages? Inej asked, sizing her up. She did not think this ivory and amber girl had scaled a silo just to make her acquaintance. In a fight, Dunyasha's height would give her a longer reach, but it might impact her balance. Had Van Eck sent her? And if so, had he sent someone after Nina too? She spared the briefest glance below, but could see nothing in the deep shadows of the silos. Who do you work for? Knives appeared in Dunyasha's hands, their edges gleaming brightly. Our work is death, she said, and it is holy. An exultant light filled her eyes, the first true spark of life Inej had seen in her, and then she attacked. Inej was startled by the girl's speed. Dunyasha moved like a painted light, as if she were a blade herself, cutting through the darkness, her knives slicing in tandem, left, right. Inej let her body respond, dodging more on instinct than anything else, backing away from her opponent, but avoiding the silo's edge. She fainted left and then slipped past Dunyasha, managing the first thrush of her own. Dunyasha whirled and evaded the attack easily, weightless as sun blot gilding the surface of a lake. Inej had never seen someone fight this way, as if she were moving to music only she could hear. Are you afraid, Wraith? Inej felt Dunyasha's knife shred through her sleeve. The sting of the blade was like burning lash. Not too deep, she told herself. Unless, of course, the blade was poisoned. I think you are. You cannot fear death and be its true emissary. Was the girl mad or just chatty? Inej bobbed backward, moving in a circle around the silo's roof. I was born without fear, Dunyasha continued with a happy chuckle. My parents thought I would drown because I crawled into the sea as a baby laughing. Perhaps they worried you would talk yourself to death. Her opponent drove forward with new intensity, and Inej wondered if the girl had only been toying with her in that first aggressive flurry, feeling for her strengths and weaknesses before she sees the advantage. They exchanged thrust, but Dunyasha was fresh. Inej could feel every ache and injury and trial of the last month in her body. The knife wound that had almost killed her, the trip up the incinerator, the days she'd spent bound in captivity. I confess to disappointment, Dunyasha said as her feet skipped nimbly over the silo's roof. I had hoped you might prove a challenge, but what do I find? A smudge of a Suli acrobat who fights like a common street thug. It was true. Inej had learned her technique from boys like Kaz and Jesper in the alleys and crooked streets of Ketterdam. Dunyasha didn't have just one mode of attack. She bent like a reed when required, stalked forward like a prowling cat, retreated like smoke. She had no single style that Inej could grasp or predict. She's better than me. The knowledge had the taste of rot, as if Inej had bitten into a tempting fruit and found it foul. It wasn't just the difference in their training. Inej had learned to fight because she had to if she wanted to survive. She'd wept the night she'd made her first kill. This girl was enjoying herself. But Ketterdam had taught Inej well. If you couldn't beat the odds, you changed the game. End scene. Cuckoo crazy pants up there. I know. Dunyasha crazy crazy. Mm -hmm. She is just... Oi. Oi vey. (laughs) So, um... Inej takes this opportunity to pretty much just go back across the wire. And so she's, you know, she's bouncing, she's walking across the wire. And then all of a sudden she's surprised because she feels a weight behind her, which means Crazy Pants is following her. So Crazy yeah. Pants Crazy. Sh- shoots some- like shoots something from her wrist and Inej feels this stab of pain in her calf. Inej turns herself around so she can face Crazy Pants Dunyasha as she snaps her wrists again and shoots Inej in the thigh with a spiked metal star. Inej hears shouting from below and then kind of remembers and wonders, oh my gosh, what's Nina up to? Um, And what is she having to deal with? But she doesn't take her attention away from her present state, which is good because she is balancing from a wire. Um, (laughs) So... This crazy woman is following her with shooting stars. Ooh. <laughs> Dunyasha tells Inej how she 
heard she used to work at the Peacock and she would have killed everyone in the building and herself before being used like that. She's telling her this also while having the stars being shot at her and trying to dodge them and not get shot. It's like a horror movie. <laughs> it really is. Like, I can't imagine any of this. I mean, like, I couldn't do it. I'd be on the ground already. <laughs> Just fall off the silo. Like, yeah, exactly. I wouldn't have made it on the wire. <laughs> like, she keeps dodging, but then gets hit. Of course, I mean, she's... I, I'm surprised she's been able to dodge <laughs> while she's on this wire. Um, she gets hit in the right shoulder. Inej tells Dunyasha, you're being used right now um, by Van Eck, and he isn't worthy of your skill. And here comes the quote. Dunyasha says, if you must know, Pekka Rollins pays my wages, said the girl, and Inej's footsteps faltered. Rollins. He pays for my travel, my lodgings, but I ask no money for the lives I take they are the jewels I wear. They are my glory in this world and will bring me honor in the next, end quote. So we're kind of like everybody's realizing Pekka Rollins is really screwing with this whole team. So, yeah. Because um, he's just, he's he's with Kaz that mm -hmm. we just read and now he's... The Dime Lions are at the tomb. Yep. And he's now called this crazy lady. <laughs> um... Crazy pants. Crazy pants. Just poor Inej. So Inej is shocked um, because she's thinking about Nina below and who knows what she's dealing with. She then gets shot just two more times. Just two more times <laughs> by these stars. From uh. So this is the end of the chapter. She glanced over her shoulder only 10 more feet and she would be at the first silo. Dunyasha might know more about fighting than Inej ever would, but she didn't know Ketterdam. Inej would race to the bottom of the silo, find Nina. They'd lose this monster in the streets and canals Inej knew so well. Again, she gauged the distance behind her. Just a few more feet, but when she looked back, Dunyasha was no longer on the wire. Inej saw her bend, saw her hand reach for the magnet. No! Protect me, she whispered to her saints. The line went slack. Inej fell, twisting in the air the way she had as a child, searching for her wings. End quote. End chapter. Oh, ah! she's falling again. Yeah, <laughs> and it's just, like, so, like, devastating after, like, just, you know, we found out she fell as a child. Uh -huh. and, but then, sorry, her what she learned as a child was then to never, ever, ever have a net again. Yeah, but, because it like caught, it like bounced her out onto the ground. So she like got hurt worse. And so in her brain, she was like, not doing that again. I, hmm, I hear, I think she would have been hurt worse if she just mm -hmm. fell and died. <laughs> yep. But, you know, pain as a child probably is. We all have those. <laughs> yeah, she probably remembers it a lot. Yes. So, I mean. So yeah, so yeah, we got we just we got a new character, Crazy Pants Dunyasha. Crazy Pants. <laughs> she is crazy though. Who talks like that? I don't know. <laughs> I don't. Yeah. All right, chapter twenty one. We're back with Kaz. Okay. So remember, Rollins was like, "Hey, what's up, y'all?" Hello. Um, yeah. So Rollins tells Kaz that about mm, right now, his lieutenant should be rounding up the rest of the crows. And that he had special plans for Inej, which of course sends Kaz into a little mini spiral in his head. Oh. Kaz tells yeah. Rollins, like, but you're working for Van Eck. And Rollins is like, nope, I'm working with Van Eck. After you kidnapped Alice, Van Eck came to me for help. Um, he says that he knows Kaz would have come to the house because he's too busy holding a grudge. Kind of funny since he doesn't know who Kaz is. And we clearly right. know that Kaz has been holding on to this for a long time. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I, I have this little quote because I thought it was interesting. That's where you're wrong, said Kaz. I don't hold a grudge. I cradle it. I coddle it. I feed it fine cuts of meat <laughs> and send it to the best schools. I nurture my grudges, Rollins, end quote. I just thought it was, it's yeah. funny because Kaz is like on this totally other side of it where he knows who Rollins is. And he's still not giving, like, 
so many opportunities mm-hmm. to say it, and like they would have made a punch, but he's still holding on he's to cradling it, cradling it. He's coddling it, and he's, he's sending, sending it, it to, to school. <laughs> he nurtures them. Yeah, I just thought he's it was a it fun. To the best schools. I know. I thought it was a fun quote. Mm. I mean, can you imagine like just saying that to somebody point blank? That just is kind of kind of awesome. I think it's funny. I like it a <laughs> lot because I like imagining like just interest. I don't know. I can't imagine coming up with that. Like right away, <laughs> you know, as a comeback, I'd. Well, yeah, because who sends grudge to schools? And which <laughs> would you pick an Ivy League? I mean, what is like it would be the like best a private schools? school? Probably like have uniforms. Well, that's what I was wondering. And what would the uniforms be for a grudge? For a grudge, yeah. Hmm. I don't know. Well, I we'll... know it just it. <laughs> uh, we really interesting read. Crazy pants and uh-huh. grudges that go to school. Yep. Yeah. God, I hope they really get scholarships and can like, because Kaz is going to have a lot of tuition to pay if they keep up with this like mm-hmm. education. Maybe I'm, crazy pants and the um, the grudge that goes to school can live a happy life together. Aww. Oh, <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> that I don't even know where we're going with that. Who knows? Um, so he also asked why he thinks Van Eck will honor his agreement with him since he screwed the crows over, and Rollins was like. Um, yeah, dude, I got the cash up front. Silly. That's what you're supposed to do. Um, he got paid a few million Krug. Rollins and asked Kaz for the seal. Kaz holds it up, but he hesitates. There's Stodd watch everywhere. He tries to keep Rollins' eyes on the seal. Remember when he was younger, he practiced magic, like mm-hmm. sleight of hand. Mm, so he's yeah. like got his hands up with like the little flashy seal trying to keep Rollins' eyes busy. While he opens the jar of auric acid with his other hand and tells Wyland, get ready. He tosses the seal to Rollins and in the same motion, pours the acid onto the floor. Remember the hissing thing? And it, yeah. yeah. He just pours it on the floor and he made it weak enough to where he just like stomps on it really hard and they fall through the floor. And of course, of all places, they fall onto the dining room table underneath which, of course, remember they're holding a party. Yeah. Has all of the mergers set around it. <laughs> so what a scene. Like, they just fall, like, right in the middle of all these mergers. Funny story. I've fallen through a roof and a floor, <laughs> in other words. Like, I mean, like, a ceiling that was the floor. Yeah. I did that as a kid. Mm. Just letting you know. I fell into well, my brother's room. <laughs> well, now you know how Cass <laughs> feels. <laughs> I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, they take off running. There's two guards at the door. Kaz kind of like does the sliding motion and like has his cane sideways and like takes them out by the knees. Um, oh. and then they make it out past the boathouse. Remember that place where all that crazy stuff happened? Yeah. Um, out to the yeah. gondola <laughs> where Roddy was waiting. And while the bullets are being fired at them, Wyland lets loose a ton of flash bombs and other things. Whatever he had on him, he just like starts throwing out. Yeah, who out. knows what he's got. Yeah. <laughs> and everyone just like runs for cover. As they're rowing out, Kaz starts running through the fact that Rollins had said that he had his friends. He starts going through the list of crows in his head. He realizes that he needs to get to an edge. He says Jesper and Matthias are fighters, and there's no way they'd harm Kue. He doesn't know. So they're going to Sweet Reef because that's where Inej is. Wylan is feeling some kind of way. And Kaz says, I love this quote. It's the end of the chapter. And I just, I just like it. Kaz says, quote, pick up a pair of oars and make yourself useful or I'll put your pampered ass in the drink and let your father fish you out. End quote. (laughs) Nice. It's a good way to end the chapter. I love that so much because it is exactly... Something I would say. It's very much Kaz, too. 100% something I would say. Um, so I really, I I really felt that. You, yes. <laughs> no, I'm glad you, you connected with that. I did. I really connected with that. It's a beautiful quote. It is. <laughs> no, put it on a shirt or make felt a it. Felt bookmark. Right there in my heart. Yeah. <laughs> well, that was a lot, but we, we did a good job, girl. A lot happened. It really did. It really did. So... A lot's going on, but we got to remember we are at the like Mm -hmm. halfway point of the sequel, uh, the end really of the story. I mean, kind of. When it yet? We're at the denouement, Mm. the the crest of the story. Oh, that's that's some French right there. It is. 
It's also okay. from a Tori Amos song. That's where I learned it from. Don't tell anyone. Oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't know that. What song? Tonight, Josephine. Oh. Not tonight, Josephine. Not tonight. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. I don't recognize <laughs> it for some reason. I'm like, what? But anyways, I'll have to listen to it. Then. Yes. I, I love I, it. Because I know the song, but. Well, I'm obsessed with Napoleon, like obsessed with the Napoleonic era. And so that song is about Josephine, who was his lover, and the, like the letters they would write back and forth. And so I was just like, oh, my God, I love this song. And I'm obsessed with it. And it's I'm really t- short. You know that like somehow down my line, like I seriously like he, I'm, he's part of my line. Did I tell you that? Well, yeah. And that's why we're friends. Okay, really. good. I was figured. I figured. I figured it was a couple things, but you know, this nail. It, it's right there. That was there. it. Mm-hmm. It was a Napoleon thing. It was. Yep. I'm. I'm really s- related to Napoleon. If you ever want to do one of those tests, if you find out. Yep. <laughs> and I'm a Jew, which is really crazy. Mm. I know. Okay, so <laughs> enough. Like we run off on. We've got. We've done tangents before, but I think tonight. Yeah. Was it was an all time. All time high. I hope you guys kept up because that's what our heads are like all the time. All the time. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um anyways, it's that time for <laughs> Greece, Greece you cast, cast news. <laughs> yeah. That was we're on point tonight. I try to make it as ugly as possible. Well, there isn't a lot of Greece cast news to nope. be honest. Um I don't There's think one we're little have thing. much from like here on until the show starts picking up. No, because I mean we've we've covered everything. I mean the only thing that I saw was like a Luma crate is um coming out with a special Lives of Saints like edition, which everyone's doing, like which really kind of like just to be honest, like is pissing me off because like <laughs> all these different boxes are coming out with like their own special edition of these two books that are coming out or three whatever. And you can only get them if you are subscribed or you like it's just like there's gonna be there's all these special edition why do people do this because it pisses like, me off it's like pokemon you got to collect them all well this special okay so at first i wanted this but then when i read further into it i didn't so this special lives of saints just has this like dust cover that's got these really cool pictures of like it looks like alina and the darkling and things like that but it says Special pictures of the art from inside the book. So it's just pictures that are already mm. going to be inside the book. Oh. So I don't, yeah. Okay. No, don't. I don't need that. <laughs> I know other fans out there probably would love it. It is, it does look gorgeous, but you know, I just. Yeah, there's some people that like absolutely have to have everything. Yeah. I don't need to. No, I don't need that. I don't. Not when it, I need the pictures, like I need the special artwork, but if I already have the artwork in the book, I'll be very happy with just that. So. Yeah. But that's all I got for Grishcast news. There I mean, that was it. So, <laughs> I mean, that's it. That that's where it ends. And um I um just realized something. What did you realize? I realized um, that we've got to, f- did you have anything interesting happen this weekend? <laughs> um, no, not, oh, well, it was my son's, my younger son's birthday. So I officially have two teenagers. Woo! Yeah, really? And, um, <laughs> we, tr- <laughs> we tried to do a bunch of things and, um, it, it didn't all work out, but he got to go into the, um, 6.50 a.m. WSM uh, Studios, Opry Radio. My partner would hate me saying that, but everyone knows it as Opry Radio. He got to go in there and he got to record a weather segment and um, see how everything worked in there. And that was fun for him. That seems exciting. Yeah, it was. It was it was cool. And it was fun to like have like some pictures and stuff of him in there. So oh. yeah. And then um I also cut a bunch of hair off today. Well, you I was- and I know because <laughs> I was tired of it, so I just went. Bloop. Well, that's that's what you got to do when times are rough. Mm-hmm. And um, so for those <laughs> of you trying to figure out what our next week's chapters are, don't worry because we've got them right here. 
we're going to do just the next two <laughs> um, chapters. No. <laughs> How about we just... Okay. Yeah, we're going to do we'll the next two. Know. We're going to do the next two chapters. So <laughs> okay. we just finished. So we're going to do 22 and 23. All right. Yes. Just that's that's what we're going to do. <laughs> that's what we're doing. We love you guys. Thank you for <laughs> bearing with us. Mm-hmm. Goodness gracious, because it has been an episode. Um, God, we, we messed up with the Glistener Cities. I forgot to look and see what chapters we were reading next week. So hopefully... That'll be enough. But we'll, we are professionals. We are. But we always are. So, you know, we're, we're going to mess up every once in a while. That's so, okay. It is. Um, moving on. Yeah. Moving on on. That's it for our week. Okay. Well, we will see you all next week. Like, we're at the end of the hour, so my voice is a little husky. It was. No, no mourners. mourners. No funerals. This has been GrishaCast. Connect with us on the web at GrishaCast.com. Send an email to info at GrishaCast.com. Follow us on Instagram at GrishaCast, YouTube at GrishaCast, Twitter at GrishaCast, and Facebook at GrishaCast. A special thank you for our background music created by Kendra Dantes and produced by Year 26. Bye! Bye!